Hey guys, welcome back. Today's video is a suggestion from Charmaine. She recently did a My Favorite Textural Plants video, which I will link in the description. She was like, you need to do one too because you were better at explaining textures, which I am not sure if that's true, but I do love my textures, so I'll give it a go. Texture in plants is so important to me, I've come to realize. Like it's one of the surefire ways for me to fall out of love with a plant if the plant has like very just underwhelming texture or like less substantial than I expected it to be before I got it. So I've rounded up eight plants that I find just really irresistible in terms of texture. Like I could just sit there and just like fondle them all day. By no means is this a exhaustive list of my favorite textural plants in my collection because if it's in my collection then it most likely has some like oomph to it but these are like some of my favorites and also texture is like so subjective like what's really nice for me might be like disgusting to some of you so bear that in mind if you have any suggestions on your favorite textural plants that you think I would like or other people would like feel free to leave in the comments but these are eight that are just kind of like up there for me in terms of like having texture that you might not really expect this is in no particular order, but I'll kind of try to group them up in terms of like similarities in texture. So we are going to just get the really obvious one out of the way, even though it might not be super obvious because I've never shown this on my channel, but this is my Sininja Leucotrica. I may have shown it once, I don't remember, I, I, but I very rarely show this plant on my channel just because it's like in my living room and I never really show my living room plants. But this plant, if you haven't seen it before, you must not be on Instagram because this is like shared very heavily. So this plant is a codex plant. It has a little bulb that it grows out of and it has the most adorable fuzzy leaves. I'm actually surprised how big these leaves turned out. I thought they were gonna stay like around this size and I don't know why these two stay so small, why these two like blew up. But I'm not super good at growing these plants. I can only really get like one stalk to, to come out and then it dies and then another few comes out. I never get it to grow like super full. But let's talk about the texture. So it has like this like fine fuzz all over it and it is so stinking soft. Like it's just, it's like baby animal soft. Like you know how like a puppy has such soft fur compared to when it's an adult. And just like, imagine feeling it's, well, Charmaine says it's like the dog's ear, which is really accurate, but I wanna think of something original. <laughs> so it's kind of like, maybe, maybe like the fur around its belly because it's like really fine, it's not really dense, but it is so, so soft. And like, you have to be really gentle with it, like a baby, I wanna see if it, no, <laughs> I was like expecting that it might smell like baby powder for some reason. Cause doesn't it look like it should smell like baby powder? And I was like, why, why would a plant evolve to have hairs? Like why would this plant evolve to have hairs? Because I think it's kind of an arid plant, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I always think of codex plants as more arid plants. And um, usually, usually, hairs are there to increase surface area to absorb more nutrients or more moisture from the air anyways i'm just speculating but in my mind <laughs> in my mind i'm like maybe it evolved to be so precious that humans will just take over and coddle it and do everything for it and it can just sit back and relax probably not true evolutionarily speaking i don't think that's a thing but that's kind of where my mind goes. It just evokes a lot of like nurturing feelings in me and I'm assuming a lot of people too because you feel this and you're just like, oh sweet baby. And it's actually also super pretty. Like it's got this like very bluey tint and it's like minty. And if I bring you up close, you can see like the veins in the leaf. So if you like took away the fuzz, then it looks really, really unsuspecting. Kind of just looks like it would just be a random bush leaf but then you overlay this fuzz and that like blue minty tint and suddenly it's like, it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. So I have this planted in a very gritty rocky soil mix, 
with a like a layer at the bottom because I am terrified of rotting this codex. So the person that sold it to me recommended that I grow it like I do my Hoyas, give it a lot of light and give it warm, humid conditions. So now I'm now I'm questioning where this plant comes from. Hold on one second. Syningia leucotrica. Well, I'll be. It's from Brazil. Okay, so it's native to Brazil, which is probably why she told me to grow it like a Hoya. Honestly, I haven't really looked into this plant too much. I just very enamored by it. And whatever I'm doing is at least allowing it to grow. It has not flowered, but there are a few, focus, there are a few little like light green spots here. That's where the leaves are gonna come out. Hopefully it will hold on to this little stalk and grow through the summer. I do know that it will go through like dormancy periods. Um, after it flowers i think feel free to fact check everything i'm saying but uh we're here anyways just to talk about the texture and the texture on this is just next level it's there's nothing really like it um in terms of house plants that i know of there are some like um outdoor garden plants that are kind of similar i forget what the name of it but this is the photo it is soft but it's not this soft because not only are the hairs on this plant really soft but the leaf itself is really soft and really pliable. Those leaves are a little bit more stiff. I just really feel like this is very unique to this plant. And if you don't have one and you come across one, I highly, highly recommend that you try it. Those people who are really good at growing codiciforms, I, I look up to a lot because I find them very, very mysterious because plants that like routinely die back and knowing how to care for something when it's like not doing anything and trusting that what you're doing is is right it's just something that doesn't come naturally to me and i will just like second guess and question everything the whole time so i'm just praying that i don't kill this plant long story short and before i put it away i just want to show you the underside of the leaf because the underside is arguably even softer and a little bit like hairier Look at that. I really should show this plant a little bit more often. If it starts to grow a little bit bushier and I can kind of figure out the care, I'll definitely talk about it a little bit more. Let's do another kind of fuzzy one. This is somewhat of a common Hoya, but one of my all-time favorites. This is Hoya linearis. This is such an easy Hoya. This, this is just growing on my living room shelf under grow lights. It's so easy to propagate and like it just grows and grows and grows. I just chopped this maybe around Christmas time for Charmaine and I chopped like several, maybe one foot long cuttings for her and already it is so freaking long. I wanna just like chop it maybe like here, get all this. And what I do is I literally don't even wait. I just take a chopstick and like open up holes in the substrate and just stick them back in and then just keep the water a little bit higher for the next few weeks. And that's how I've gotten it to grow from like a single node to all this, even with like multiple chops. And it's growing in Lechuza Pond mixed with Orchiata and Perlite. And that's the fine grade Orchiata. I love these like stringy types of plants that are not like leafy, if you know what I mean. Like I'm not a huge fan of like string of hearts, string of pearls. String of pearls actually I find quite cute because they look like little peas. But texturally I love ones that are a little bit more of like a straight strand, if that makes sense. Like Ribsalis, I really like running through like a curtain of it. But the Hoya linearis, because they have tiny little fuzzies all over each leaf, it is like very soft, but then like it's it's really satisfying just to run your hands through a curtain of it like this. It's just like very therapeutic, but it's also kind of like delicate at the same time. So you just want to like softly and gently run your hands through it. And it also looks just so serene cascading down a shelf. I really just love a full pot of Linearis, which is why I really want to like give it a big chop and shove it back in. I will do that after I'm back from my holidays. There's a lot of propagating I want to do, but if you have some patience and you can just get like a tiny little cutting of it, you can grow it big. Some people say that pawn is not good for this plant, but I had like insane success with this plant in pawn. So 
I don't really know what it is about like other people's experience with um, this plant in pond, but a lot of people will say that it does the best in soil. I've never tried it in soil. I know that Charmaine's old Linearis, she used to have like maybe a slightly fuller pot than this and hers was in soil and it died, but pond has just been like just zero maintenance other than watering for me. So I, 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 that's my preferred medium for most of my Hoyas anyways, but it's certainly like super easy to grow this plant in pond for me. And it's just like out in my living room. It's under Monio's TA grow lights, but that's only like up here where it gets the light. So down here it gets like quite low light, but it's just the best growth pattern because it doesn't vine sideways, upwards. Well, I mean, sometimes it'll go upwards, but once it gets long enough, it will start to like weigh down and trail. It just trails. Like there's very few Hoyas that just like trail neatly like this and like just allow you to do this kind of thing. I cannot imagine ever falling out of love with this plant. I just realized this strand is dead or dying. Why? Interesting. Just this one is dying. I feel like this is a Hoya for non-Hoya people. It's just so beautiful and it's not like string of hearts where it gets all tangled up and you have to like undo it because of all those leaves that like get caught. Like, you know what I mean? With the linear is because it's so straight, you can very easily like kind of pry them apart and it doesn't get all tangled. So it's just oh, one of the best trailing plants of all time, in my opinion. It's so good. My dream is to have like a really, really full, um, maybe like in a bigger pot. And it's just like this dense mass of Linearis cascading down a shelf. I would really love it. If I had enough light in my house, I would just be growing it on like a shelf on a wall, like not under grow lights, because I think it's beautiful when people are able to do that. But I just don't have enough light for that, so I can admire other people's. But this is a great plant to decorate with and a really great plant to just like have in a room when you walk in and you can just like run your hands through it. It's just very therapeutic. I just don't know what else to say. If you're not a fan of fuzzy, um, there will be non-fuzzy ones later. Just, just stay tuned. So this one I featured not too long ago. This is Hoya Velosa. Also, um, I recently learned because Hoya stuff is changing all the time, you guys. Like, I just can't keep up. Hoya Velosa is now just called Hoya Globulosa. And there are like different varieties. There's like a long leaf and a short leaf variety. So mine is definitely not the long leaf. The long leaf is like very narrow and like all the leaves are quite slender and long. Mine have a tendency to grow kind of like these stubby little leaves. Although the newest leaf is a little bit on the long side, but it shouldn't stay like this. My plant has always been like this kind of leaf. So it's kind of small right now because I recently chopped like like three feet off of it and I sold little cuttings. So this is the mother plants, what I got left. And um, since the chop, it has put out this one leaf. But the texture, this is one of the best textural Hoyas. Not only is it very waxy and has that thickness and that girth, and it has a shiny veiny dark leaf that has like just, there's a lot of thickness to this, but it has fine fuzz all over the daxial. You can see little tiny microscopic hairs. But then the underside of the leaf, that's where like the really like dense fuzz is. It's really short fuzz, but it covers the entire leaf. It almost kind of feels like, like actual velvet, like that velvety fabric that they cover <laughs> expensive things in, like jewelry and like high-end liquor, because it's very dense and it's like the hairs are very short, like it's like a short pile, if you will. It is really satisfying just to like run your finger back and forth on it. And even on the really old leaves, like sometimes some plants that are like fuzzy, on the old leaves, the fur starts to kind of like bald and it starts to like kind of deteriorate or brown and fall off. But even on these really old leaves, this leaf probably is like, I don't know, a couple years old, at least a year old. And it's just as soft as the newer one. Actually, maybe a little less soft. The brand new leaves are obviously the most like baby soft but the fur is still here on the old ones. So this Hoya just has so much going for it. Like it has like substantial texture in terms of thickness and like meatiness. And then it has this like really soft side to it as well. Even as I like 
get a little bit less into Hoyas. This is always one that I'll really love because just it's just so precious and it also grows really fast and it's super easy. I have it in Pond, which I haven't repotted in at least a year at least a year, like maybe a year or two years. It gets underwater quite frequently. I chopped so much off of it and it started growing almost immediately. So I know this plant um, is endemic to Vietnam from a province called Cao Bang, but can somebody tell me if like the Cao Bang Velosa or Globulosa is any different than other Globulosa? Are there Globulosas from other part of the world that aren't Cao Bang or like do all of them originate from Kaobang? That's something I was trying to like verify on Facebook, like on the Hoya groups, but I couldn't really find the answer to it. But I would like to know, because sometimes people ask, is it like a Hoya Velosa Kaobang or just a regular, or is there a difference? And I have no clue. So if anybody is a Hoya expert here that knows, please let me know. So we're gonna take a brief break from fuzzy plants to talk about my Anthurium Carib Queen. So this is one that I show fairly regularly. This is um, a hybrid of, let me get the order right, Anthurium Dresseri, no, yes, Anthurium Dresseri crossed with Rubulosum. And this is a J. Vanini hybrid that I got from Amanda, aka Bunny on Instagram. So if you know Anthurium Dresseri, I'll put a photo right here. It's very velvety, it's like kind of a um, girthy. You know how like sometimes anthurium, like velvety anthuriums will be velvety but kind of thin? Dresseri, I, I've never seen one in person but I assume it's one of those like thicker ones. And then rugulosum is kind of like a thinner leaf plant. I've, I've seen one in person before. It's a little bit thinner leaf, it is like not shiny shiny glossy but it is like a glossier plant and it has this like fine pebbly texture so the hybrid is very rugulosum heavy but the leaf itself has a very dresseri shape so to me it's kind of like dresseri put on a rugulosum skin but the shape and the venation to me looks very dresseri but one thing i wasn't really prepared for when i started growing this plant is that the texture is going to be a lot more like almost velvety. I thought just by looking at the pictures that the this plant would be more shiny, glossy, like the rugulosum. And I really couldn't wrap my brain around like what the big deal is other than like, oh, it's a J. Benini hybrid. I didn't get why it was so special until I started growing it and, and until the leaves started to size up. And as the plant starts to mature, I'm noticing that the texture is like way more like buttery velvet than the very juvenile leaves. Even this leaf down here, which is not like a seedling size leaf, it's not glossy, but it is a lot smoother than this one. Like this one and the newest leaf that is still um, expanding has this like super glittery, like delicious texture and that pebbliness is really, really satisfying to just like stroke this leaf. It's not quite like a velvet leaf anthurium. It's not quite like a luxurians hybrid because the pebble is so much tighter. So this one was actually quite a surprise that it would end up being like one of my favorite texture plants because I didn't think it would be. Because I find rugulosum kind of a little bit too thin of a leaf to be super satisfying. But I think the Carib Queen is a little bit thicker and it has just a, like a more silicone-y, sub velvety finish. So it's like 10 times better than rugulosum, in my opinion. And I don't think rugulosum is very easy either. Neither is Dressleri actually, but together as a hybrid, it's, it's quite an easy going plant. It's constantly growing. We got this in August of last year, but it was a leafless chonk at that time. So we got it and then a leaf immediately sprouted and it was like this big, like, you know, like regular seedling leaf. And now it's, we're probably at like nine, 10 months and we're like at this size and it's got like such an easy going root system. I have it in tree fern fiber with some perlite and pond mixed through. I recently pulled it back a little bit from the light because I noticed that a little bit of bleaching was happening. Um, so hopefully this leaf will form uh, with just like nice 
full green color, but it's never going to be like a very dark anthurium. And I also really like, in terms of texture, like um, this very winged petiole. Will it focus on that? As if I can't tell if that's focused, but Dresslerai has like a very, very heavily winged petiole and that did get passed on to this plant. It's not quite so many wings, I don't think, but it's also a very fun shape. I don't know how easy it is to get um, this plant it would probably have to be a cutting or an offset. I don't even see people selfing it. Maybe it's not very easy to self this plant. Maybe it's sterile, maybe. I'm gonna just pop a photo here really quick so you can see what it looks like under sunlight because it's glittery and it's so beautiful. It's just so unassuming. Like just at a quick glance, it doesn't look like much, but the deeper you look at it and the more you feel it, just like so much more starts popping out of it. I really, really love this plant. Amanda, thank you so much for sending this. I feel like she knows me better than I know myself because I would have never been like, I need that plant. <laughs> now that I have this plant, like I, I need it. Even though I have it, I just need it. I don't know if you can tell, but the sun's starting to come down here and it's getting real hot in here. Hmm. So this next one is one that like, I fell in love with because of the texture, not quite as much because of how it looked. I did like how it looked, but the texture really just like, you know, put it over the edge. So this is Anthurium nigrolamnum GG, AKA SP Napo, depending on who you're buying it from. So I saw this plant for the first time at Northwood Tropicals about a year ago when we went to film at her shop and we did a little shop tour and she had just imported like a humongous one. I'm gonna put a photo here of uh, Charmaine holding this plant. It was huge. And because it was so mature, the texture was even better than the juvenile one. But being in front of that plant made me feel like I could not live without it in my life. So the next time that Equigenera came to Vancouver, I picked one of these up. So it's a very sharp, lobey anthurium, which looks very evil and menacing. But the thing I really love about it is it has like all these veins that run through it. So the leaf blade is not smooth. It has like just this veiny texture. And because the leaf is also like very thick and leathery, not only is there visually a lot going on because you can see all these veins running through it and it kind of like protrudes out of the plant, but just feeling it just feels, just, just there's just a lot there. I really love leaves like this. I don't know about you, but leaves that have really thick waxy texture. There's a sturdiness to it. It almost feels like the plant is hardier, like it's trying a little harder, like it's doing a bit more. So right now the leaf is not as like thick and leathery as the mature ones, but as it matures, it's gonna get a little bit thicker, a little bit more veiny. Um, and on top of that, it has like red in the leaf margins, mainly, yeah, mainly in the sinus and the midrib. So you can see that it's like red here, the petiole is red. On the older leaf, the red starts to fade, but it kind of sticks around in the sinus. I have it growing in no drainage in my pond mix, and it is due for a repot, but it's a little bit late for repots now because I'm leaving in a few days, so whoever didn't get repot by the time I leave, too bad. <laughs> I might actually just risk it and repot it real quick before I go. I feel like it's gonna be fine. I don't see why it wouldn't be fine. This root just wants to be near water. <laughs> so if I get into like a bigger vessel, probably like one of my deli cups and I can get pond up to here, then it'll start to root out a little bit more and be a little bit more stable. But yeah, if you like really thick leaf plants, you like just different shapes in your plants and just like, you know, more visual interest. I really highly recommend this. If you don't have one already, the prices keep dropping. But if you ever have a chance to see like a mature one, and I mean like leaves that are like three feet long, just go up and touch it. It's just, it's just, it's just wonderful. It's really, really wonderful. Okay, so sticking with the very girthy, <laughs> thick leafed anthuriums, this is my anthurium windlingeri. I was not prepared. I was not prepared for how freaking, how can I hold this properly? I was not prepared for how thick these leaves would be. I got this plant as a very small plant because the leaves were like this big. And they're like thick, they're very thick and plasticky, but it's not the same as when the leaf is this big. This is how much give it has. It's like it just sticks straight up. These leaves, I could literally just hold it in my hand all day while I watch TV. And it's just like my emotional support leaf. 
is so strong, it's so thick and so waxy. It's just like there for you in your time of need. And not only is it like really thick and waxy, but it has like this like dimply kind of like very when linger eye texture. Actually this um, form of when linger eye is not even the most dimply kind. Like for example, the NSC when linger eye is very dimply, which I really want to get my hands on one of those because like it's so, <laughs> it's, it's just mesmerizing. But I'm also very happy with mine. I don't know what form this is, but I freaking love it because it's dark, it's it's thick, it's kind of shiny, but as the leaf like hardens and, and ages, it does become like a lot more matte. When the leaf is really new, it is like glossy, like you can see your reflection in it. Now that the leaf has been hardened off for like several weeks, it hardens to this like matte color and <laughs> just look, look how beautiful it is. I cannot with this plant. There's not a single person that can pry this plant from my dead body. Like I love this plant. It's one of my favorites in my entire collection. I think I could really just collect all the different forms of Winlingeri and grow them in a room because they're very rewarding. They're not fast. I wouldn't say they're like the easiest. They are tough, but it's kind of, it, it took me a while to get it to start growing because in the past it would just grow like one leaf every like six months and it was very it was very discouraging but once it started to grow um since i put it in like a tree fern mix and inoculated it with great white then we started to get going and i i never want to go back to like a wind linger eyeless life because what kind of life was that i'm just gonna pan so you can see like kind of like the finish of the leaf. And bearing in mind that the camera is kind of blowing it out so it does look darker in person. Imagine if you were very talented, right, at growing plants and you were able to grow this plant into like a behemoth that had like four or five feet long leaves. Would you not be in heaven? At some point, I'm gonna have to move this out of my tent and probably hang it from the ceiling somewhere and get some like grow lights on it because it's not gonna be able to live in there forever. I also know it doesn't need to be in a greenhouse, but I think warmth does help it speed things along. So maybe next summer I'll do it. I definitely don't wanna be moving it out of a greenhouse like in the middle of winter. So it's gonna stay in there for the foreseeable future. I'm hoping that I come back from vacation and I'll have a new leaf because the, the new leaves are so fun to watch on this because when they come out of the sheath, they're literally like this big and it's got like the width of a toothpick and then it expands to this thing. The expansion on a Wenli leaf is unlike any other anthurium I have. Um, usually I can tell how big an anthurium leaf when it emerges because like of the thickness of the petiole and how big the little rolled up leaf is like sometimes a large leaf will emerge like pretty big and then you're like okay that's going to be a big leaf when it expands but with the when linger eye it comes out just microscopic and you just don't know sometimes it's going to come out and it's going to be like this big sometimes it can be this big and sometimes i don't know it's just like it's a lottery it's so much fun i think it's really important to know where your when Leroy came from just so you can like compare with other people and you can kind of know what it's going to look like because the variation between when lingerize are quite different actually while we're on the topic of when lingerie, just like something that i recently read so when linger is kind of known for its corkscrew and fluorescence so the flower, when it comes out of the spathe, is kind of straight and then as it grows bigger, bigger, it turns into this like ringlet shape. Now that I'm saying this, I might have already talked about it in a video and I don't remember, but if I did, I'm sorry. But there is a botanist on Facebook um, in the Anthurium groups or all the enthusiast groups. Her name is Carrie. So she was talking about like the different forms of wind lingerie and um, how usually it's lowland species or, or um, when lingerize that have evolved to live in lower elevation have straighter inflorescences and then the curly ones are more highland higher elevation and the thought is like and this is maybe not proven but the thought is that at higher elevations there's more wind so the curling is meant to prevent pollen from being blown away by the wind um, but I thought that was really interesting. So once I get a few successful flowers from this plant and see whether it like consistently is straight or consistently is curly, then I might have an idea of where it might have come from. But that said, some Wendlies will produce straight inflows and then later becomes curly. Some will do like one or the other and kind of alternate. 
There's just so much cool things about the Wenli. I really, really think everyone should own one if you have anthuriums. If you like strappy anthuriums, it is like a must. With strappy anthuriums, it does require some patience because like as a small plant, it's just really not very satisfying to grow. It doesn't, it doesn't fulfill that strappy desire until it starts to get longer and it does take some time. But it is so worth it, you guys. It's really, really worth it. My arm's getting tired now. I'm gonna put you down. Okay, second to last one is a fuzzy guy. This is Philodendron Serpens. So I haven't shown this in a while. I've just been really into anthuriums lately, but this has been living in my tent this whole time. This is um, maybe one and a half years or two years in my possession. Yeah. Just doing a quick spider mite check while we're here. So this is one of those plants where it's really hit or miss with people. People like the fuzz, they don't like the fuzz, but the texture is all on the petiole. The leaves are actually really nice because like they have a very matte finish and they can be really dark. I really love this like keyhole sinus thing. It's so pretty. Sometimes I've seen ones that are like super glossy. Mine definitely hardens to like this like matte color. But yeah, it is a very beautiful leaf. Some people find it boring. I think they're really pretty. But the reason why people get the serpents is obviously because of the fuzzy petiole. Or I guess you could also say like the reason why people don't get the serpents is because of the fuzzy petiole. Like my boyfriend thinks this is absolutely hideous and vile and disgusting. I cannot get enough of these petioles. They are so stinking soft. I can't even compare this to anything. I feel like it's it's got kind of a feeling of a really soft rubbery plastic, but it doesn't feel like fur. It doesn't feel like hair. It feels a little bit like a soft rubber but very fine. So it is actually quite soft to run your fingers through. And I will say of all the hairy petiole philodendrons, I think Serpens is one of the most hairy ones. Like it's definitely more hairy than the Squamicol, the Squamiferum. The hairs are just more dense and a little bit longer as well. If you've never touched a Serpens before, hopefully I'll be able to convey the softness to you, like how it barely makes any sound as I run my fingers through it. So this is one of the plants where over time, those hairs will kind of deteriorate a little bit. So like one of the older leaves would have been this one. Um, I don't know if you can see, the hairs down here are kind of like browning at the tip. I find like when the plant is like throwing a fit, you'll have all the hairs kind of like turn brown and it looks kind of gross. And I feel like it usually starts at the base of the petiole and starts to move its way up. Because if you look up near to the leaf, it's like very green and very lush still. So that's definitely one kind of sad thing is that the fur does have like a shelf life. It doesn't stick around forever. I really like though that the, the caterpillar is also hairy. And the funny thing is the, the little hairs on the caterpillar are a little bit wiry and they're thinner. Can you see like the hairs on the petiole they start a little bit thicker at the base and they taper and get really thin. But on the caterpillar, it's just like thin all the way through and it's not as soft. Let me pull you back so you can see it better. It's so weird, right? It's kind of like puby in a way. It's not as nice to touch, I'll be honest. <laughs> but the caterpillar doesn't stick around anyways. It's the petiole. It's the petiole that we're interested in. I feel like everyone's been exposed to the serpents many times by now. So if you don't like it by now, you probably never will. Okay, the last plant is also a hairy one. So if you are not about that hairy plant life, then thank you for watching and I'll see you in next week. So this is a plant that I very rarely ever show on my channel. Maybe I've shown it once or twice. This is Ficus Velosa. I recently chopped like maybe a foot off, something like that, maybe nine inches off for Charmaine because hers died. We split a little cutting maybe about a year ago, maybe just over a year ago. Um, I planted it in, it's a very perlite heavy soil. I think that's what this is. No, there's no tree fern in here. And it's on a moss pole. It does this lovely little shingly pattern, but like Hoya Velosa, Ficus Velosa is also fuzzy. And it's actually so cute. I really like when people um, mist this plant because all the mist sits on the little hairs. So these leaves are really thin. So if it didn't have the fuzz going for it, I would not even want this plant in my collection. It's just these little hairs. 
These hairs are so fun and it's not a soft fur. It's a very kind of like a scratchy kind of fur. So it's not like soothing to feel. It's just very fascinating. I just love when this plant like shingles up something and I've been really behind on um, extending this moss pole, which is why I was so happy to chop it for Charmaine when I found out that hers had died. But the more it shingles, the bigger the leaves should get. And they're so dark. I feel like the sun is bright enough in this room right now that you can see the true color and like it's it's dark. It's a very dark leaf with these like little yellowy white hairs that <laughs> it looks so wrong and I love it. I do really like shingling plants like the way that they look. I don't grow many shinglers if at all because it is kind of high maintenance to me but so far even when this plant hasn't been like actually shingling on a flat surface it still has been producing like this shingly pattern. How cute is that? It's so cute. It's so stinking cute. And I thought this was gonna be like a plant that like needed like 100% humidity, otherwise it was gonna die. Even as I moved it out of like a high humidity XO to like a lower humidity XO that's not like weather sealed, it's probably around 60% humidity. It didn't really skip a beat. It didn't really stop growing. It didn't start to like wilt crisp up. It's just been super easy going and it grows pretty steadily. Ah, I chopped it actually for Charmaine when we filmed the Who Grows It Better video, so not that long ago. And it's already popped three growth points. So you can see there's one, I don't know if you can see, but there's one here, one right here, and one down here as well. So if it actually branches out in three directions, I don't know what I'm gonna do. So if you're into hairy plants or just kind of like weird plants that aren't quite like the other plants, then this is definitely a cool one to have. It's small, it's shingles, it's dark. Either grow it up a plank or get it onto like quite a wide moss pole so it can kind of shingle against it. I don't think that a stake would do all that much other than keep it upright. But if the leaves aren't able to like stay flat and shingle, then I feel like it kind of defeats the purpose of this plant because it looks so good just like with all the leaves facing out like that. So like I said, it's not a plant that's just like, ooh, such a nice feeling. It's more like, what an interesting texture and like it looks so wrong and I really like that because some things are just so ugly that it just feels right and looks right again. Like it's so ugly and it just came back around. But it's really fun, I really like it. And that is the last plant. And that wraps up my list of eight textural plants I really like for the texture. Thank you guys so much for watching all my videos every week. It means the world to me, honestly. I can't even begin to tell you how much I appreciate you. Once I get back from vacation, we're gonna get back into the plant chores, the repotting, that kind of stuff. I'm sure I'm gonna have a lot to do. But yeah, hope you guys have a great rest of the day. I love you and I'll see you next time. Mwah.